Hey guys, Spud here. Today we have a comprehensive cold start tutorial for the Mirage F1CE from Argies. I'm sure you're all a little bummed about the slight delay of the release, but you guys will have her in your hands very soon with an extra day to devote to studying to be that much more prepared for when you do get to step in the cockpit. And Eagle Dynamics and Argies get another day to squash bugs and make sure your first experience in the Mirage F1 is a positive and a fun one. So let's go ahead and get started, guys. Oh man, guys, I am so excited to welcome everyone back to the office of the Mirage F1 CE. We're parked here at Liwa Air Base on the Persian Gulf map as a nice stand-in for an Iraqi Air Force Base. Off our right at 3 o'clock, we have a very interesting variant of the Mirage F1. The two-seat, fully mission-capable trainer variant procured by the Iraqis throughout the 1980s during the Iran-Iraq War, the Mirage F1BQ. Interestingly, the two-seaters almost always wore the very beautiful desert paint scheme we can see adorning this aircraft and also on our own aircraft today. Off on our left at our 9 o'clock, we have a couple Mirage F1 EQs. The very advanced multi-role capable variant procured by the Iraqis also throughout the Iran-Iraq War. Some of the EQs even surpass the capabilities of later variants of the Mirage 2000. The very handsome bluish gray paint scheme that adorns these aircraft signify that these are probably some later sub variants, most notably the Mirage F1 EQ-4, Dash 4, Dash 5, or Dash 6 sub variants of the type. They definitely have a very colorful combat record and just some very interesting history behind them. But let's come back into our own cockpit and get started with a cold start tutorial. The very first thing that I like to do when cold starting my Mirage F1 is I like to dismount the glare shield that's mounted on the bezel around my radar scope. I find it very cumbersome and it blocks my view of some very mission critical systems in my cockpit. Most notably, the radio navigational panel, as well as our raw equipment. And you guys of course know that our raw equipment is incredibly important for increasing our survivability over the digital battlefield, and it's very important that we can look at it at a quick glance to see where a SAM or an air-to-air -air missile is coming at us from. This is of course doubly important if you're flying a real aircraft over a real battlefield. It also blocks some critical controls of our radar that are mounted on the bezel of our radar scope as well. Now thankfully, it's quite easy to get rid of this thing. First, we need to make sure that our canopy is open, and then all we have to do is click on the little tab up here on the bezel of our radar scope. We hand it off to our crew chief and he can go toss it in the bushes for all I care. If for any reason you'd like to remount the glare shield, all you got to do is just click on that tab once again and it'll pop right back up there for you. For mission makers, there is an option in the additional aircraft properties tab when you place an F1 on the map that allows you to influence whether that is mounted by default in the cockpit or not. It does not change the player's ability to mount or dismount it at will with the canopy open. But if you're trying to place some Mirage F1s for air starts, I highly recommend that you place it so that way by default the glare shield is dismounted because players will not have the ability to dismount it once they are up in the air and the canopy is closed. Also a fantastic feature of the Mirage F1 is this fantastic checklist book on our kneeboard provided by Argies by default. This is a fantastic addition to the module that will definitely allow you guys to learn your cold start procedure as quickly as possible. But once you have it down, I highly recommend that you use flows across the cockpit to increase your speed and efficiency for starting up your aircraft so you can make your taxi and takeoff time to hit your target as fragged on time and on target. As a bonus, when you're flying a multiplayer, you also won't have your friends waiting for you to start up the aircraft wondering why it's taken so long. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and start the cold start procedure by flipping the switches and pressing the buttons. First thing we'll do is we'll reach up and we'll manually grab that canopy rail, pull the canopy down, 
And because it's a hot day in the desert and we don't want to boil live inside of our greenhouse of a canopy, we'll leave the canopy slightly ajar. So let's talk about my flows that I do across the cockpit of the Mirage F1. I like to always, once I have the engine turning and everything is nominal, I like to flow down the right-hand console, flow down the center pedestal, and then finish off by flowing down the left-hand console. This basically gets our more critical systems first, our navigational type systems, all of that good stuff, and then we can get our auxiliary systems as we start to finish everything off. We can then, if needed, go back to the checklist and reference that to make sure that we've gotten everything and we haven't forgotten anything. Also, guys, keep in mind that if you are having FPS difficulties in the cockpit of your Mirage F1, you can always click on the mirror and press the M key to disable those mirrors by default, so that way you can get a little boost in your frames per second and hopefully get what you need to enjoy your new Mirage F1. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and start. Zooming into the right vertical console, we can see that we have our battery switch. We'll just turn that to the on position, and we can see our ship's battery is now powering our basic aircraft systems. We'll turn on our police lights. We always want to make sure that we are, when we're starting up our aircraft, we want to have our external lights turned on, and especially before we start taxiing. At a very busy airbase in combat conditions with aircraft starting up, shutting down, taxiing, taking off, and landing, the cacophony of noise can really confuse ground crew as to which aircraft are running, which aircraft are about to taxi, and which aircraft are going to be shutting down. You don't want a ground crew to inadvertently walk right in front of your aircraft as you're about to taxi, and when you're sitting in the cockpit of your jet, you can't hear the aircraft around you. So it's very nice to have a visual indicator of what the aircraft around you are doing, and your external lights will give that to the other pilots and ground crew around you. We'll turn on our oral warnings, and we'll cancel out our master caution. The master caution cancellation button is in the normal spot for any other Western designed aircraft, just to the left hand side of the site. Now we'll come down to the left console and talk about some changes that occurred for the startup procedure of your Mirage F1. Now, the earlier dev builds of the Mirage F1 had you actually click on this tab here to bring the throttle from the idle cut to the idle position. No longer is that the case. All you need to do is just slide your throttle forward and then retard it back to the idle position once you get the engine turning above 300 RPM once you press the start button. Another slight change here is the start button cover stays open when you click on it. You no longer have to click and hold it. This makes it a little bit simpler for you guys who are just hopping into DCS and don't really have a full grasp on how the mouse interacts with all the buttons and switches in the cockpit of a DCS module. We'll go ahead and open the fuel cock and release the guard to hold it open so that way it doesn't close and cut off fuel to our engine in flight, thus resulting in a flame out. We'll turn on our two fuel pumps, our start pump, by opening up the start switch guard cover. And we'll press and hold our start switch for one, two, three seconds. There's 300 RPM, slide the throttle forward and back to the idle position. Your engine should stabilize out at about 2,900 RPM. And now we can come right back to our right hip and turn on our ECS. So that way we can then close our canopy and seal her up. I recommend whenever you close the canopy, always seal it up right then and there. So that way you don't forget later on and have your canopy come flying off during your takeoff roll. All right, so we're going to start that flow down the right-hand side of our cockpit. We're going to reset our inverter to get rid of this caution and advisory. 
We're then going to turn on the rest of our electrical systems for the aircraft, our backup uh, ADI, our RWR, for instance, our pitot uh, heat, and other systems as well. We'll turn on our HUD, so we can see our site is now turned on. And we will turn our radar to the standby position. We can see we're getting a B-sweep graphic on our radar scope, but don't worry, the radar is not actually transmitting and you will not be burning up the radar on the ground with it in standby. Coming further aft, we'll turn our gyros to the gyromagnetic and turn on the secondary power source, and that will allow our primary ADI to align itself for use with our radio navigation and for when you're flying in IMC and you can't see outside and you wanna have a nice good artificial horizon reference. You never know when a sandstorm's gonna kick up in the desert here. Coming further aft, we can set our TAC in to 121 X-ray. We'll leave it off for now as well, but we have that ready to go for the TAC in station here at Liwa Air Base for the radio navigation that's required of us in the Mirage F1CE. We can see our oxygen blinker is going, so we are definitely breathing through our LOX system. Everything is turned on for our ECS, so that's why we're not burning up in our cockpit here anymore. We'll turn on some internal lighting so that way we can see things a little better in this kind of dark cockpit. And now we'll come around to the center pedestal. We'll go ahead and click on the stick to get rid of it. Be very careful you don't accidentally click on the ejection seat handle. Otherwise, you're gonna find yourself very frustrated during your cold start of your Mirage F1. Coming down. We'll get rid of the flag on our standby ADI. We'll set our shot cones to the automatic position so that way they can move as required for our current airspeed and altitude and air density to deliver optimal airflow to the face of our engine. And we wanna make sure that we never use the, uh, the manual position unless we have some sort of an emergency that requires it that you'll find in the checklist. This will cause a lot of headaches if you try to manually move those shock cones because you're gonna find yourself stalling your engine, even destroying your engine and just having a really, really bad time with it. We can turn on high gain nose wheel steering and we can use this switch as well to turn off our nose wheel steering. It is guarded into the on position. With nose wheel steering off, we have the nose wheel steering caution advisory light on the configuration panel of the aircraft turn on. I always like to take off in the Mirage 2000 with the nose wheel steering turned off because the nose wheel steering can be very, very sensitive, especially during a crosswind takeoff. But we'll make sure it's guarded on for now for our taxi with the high gain turned on. Coming down, we'll turn our IFF on this panel is not yet simulated, but it's always a good idea to be in the habit of always turning your IFF on because there are other aircraft in DCS where IFF is fully simulated. And if you don't turn it on, everybody's going to think you're a bad guy. Down below that, we have our trim indicators. We can see they are all neutral. If you just landed and you're rearming and refueling, you may want to use these indicators to get them back to the neutral position in case you have used a lot of trim for say an asymmetrical load on landing, or you're trying to trim way nose up to keep the aircraft on speed AOA with your stick in the center position. So now that we got that out of the way on the center pedestal, we'll just move to the left-hand console. Most important here is we'll click on the servo button and we can see that extinguishes the last of our cautions and advisories. If we do not press on the servo button and reset our autopilot servos, our autopilot will no longer function for us. Coming aft, we can see our main radio. The AR position on the radio power buttons, or knobs I should say, is off. PAL is your normal radio operation mode, of course, for using presets or setting a manual frequency. PAL plus G is also monitoring guard as well, 243.0 for military guard. That's very, very important to always make sure you're monitoring guard in case you miss a frequency handover or somebody gets shot down and they're transmitting on guard to help coordinate a rescue. 
power to five watts. And we can see we have an M and P. P for preset, M for manual, for manually setting a frequency, G for guard and silent mode, so that way you can just turn the radar to silent without turning the radar or the radio all the way off. We'll close our start button cover, so that way we don't inadvertently press our start button while in flight. If we press the start button while in flight, it will destroy the starter system and we will not have a good day as a result. Coming further aft, we can see that our high lift devices are in normal as required. Throttle is in the idle detent. All of our volumes are right here. We can adjust those as required. Coming further aft, we can reset our radar to the desired options we want for when we take off. I like to usually be in a 30 degree azimuth scan at a range of about 35 nautical miles on the scale for our radar scope. Further aft of that, we have our secondary radio, five watts for the power setting, and we'll turn it from the off position to the manual position. And we have only preset selections available to us on the secondary radio. Moving on, just outboard, or just inboard, I should say, of our throttle, we have our flaps. We'll bring the flaps all the way down to the down position for takeoff. Some additional things you may want to do while you're on the ground here is turn on your countermeasures. I always like to leave it in program so that way I can drop one chaff and one flare with a press of my chaff flare button. If you've adjusted your quantity of chaff and flares to a different value than what is usually put into the aircraft by default, you can use these buttons down below to adjust the value of how many chaff and flare you have on the aircraft. Keep in mind that the more flares you have, the less chaff you'll have. And if you have 30 flares, you'll always have zero chaff. And if you have 60 chaff, you'll always have zero flares. For the most part, I think that having a good even split between chaff and flares is probably a very, very good idea. You also have a button up here to change between our chaff and flare button, only releasing flares, only releasing chaff, or in the center, both position, releasing both chaff and flares. So we'll do a final sweep around the cockpit and ensure that we don't have any flags or any issues with anything. Caution advisories are all extinguished. Coming back here, everything looks good. We'll set this to transmit receive. For our TACAN station, oxygen's looking good. ECS is on, lights are on. Off to our left here, radio's on. Coming forward, we've got our radar all set up and good to go. Alrighty guys, the final items that we have before we're ready to actually taxi are to turn on our external lights, both our position and formation lights, as well as our landing light to inform the ground crew that we're ready to taxi, and of course to alert to other pilots who are taxiing around us that we are about to be moving our aircraft. We want to perform a control light, Make sure that everything is looking good on our control surfaces that we can see. Everything is looking great. We are ready to taxi. There are some additional things you can tweak and get ready to go on the ground, such as your armament panel to get the weapons you desire set up and ready to go in terms of their fusing and arming, as well as the stations you have selected. So that way everything is good to go once you get off the ground. It's always a very, very good idea, guys, to get as much done as you possibly can in your jet while you're still sitting stationary on the ground. Once you get up into the air or you're starting your taxi and even your takeoff roll, everything gets ex exponentially more difficult as most of your brain power is gonna be on flying your Mirage F1 because it's not fly-by-wire and it definitely requires all of your attention for this handful of an aircraft. Finally, all we need to do is hold the brakes, press our parking brake in, and we're good to go for our taxi. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned a lot from it. Please make sure that you subscribe and hit that bell icon to ensure that my videos are definitely delivered to you as a subscriber. We'll see you in the next one. Fly safe out there, guys, and have a great time with this new module when it releases tomorrow.